Welcome to the audio fiction podcast, The History Singer, written, produced, and voiced by me, your host, Jan Nichols. You should know that the story is told in sequential order, so start with 101 and carry on. Also, The History Singer is written in changing first-person narrative. From time to time, you'll hear me say a character's name. That's your cue that the following section is from that person's perspective. And now, our story continues. Elifus Grace we feasted well that night, celebrating Ariante's recovery and the resumption of our tour. I saw that Bikani shared a serving dish with Lotus and Luna. They refilled his part of the platter until Bikani pleaded with them to stop, saying something about being fattened for the slaughter. There was music after, and the tunes were particularly fast and feverish that night. Tutti, eldest brother of the little men, set a run from the devil's pace with his piping squeeze box. Dante and Diamo sawed at the strings of their vials with a mad ferocity. Presto and Nuto frolicked over the melodic line with tin whistles as Largo drove them on with his relentless drumming. The Kanye had left Lotus and Luna to sit back from the fire pit face shadowed except for the occasional glow from his long-stemmed pipe. Sitting next to Ariante, I saw Toby sign, The weed in his pipe must be old rags and rat tails. Such a stink. I don't like him any better than you, Ariante signed, but he is a guest at our fire. You shouldn't insult him. I was insulting the weed, not the man, Toby said with harsh, angular hand movements. His face went white, then dark in anger, a new moon casting light on a dim mirror. Before Ariante could make peace, Lotus and Luna pulled Toby up from his cross-legged position, insisting that he join their dance. Ariante's fingertips caressed the air, contrite. She was rewarded with a flash of white teeth as Toby smiled and flung himself into the dance. I smiled at Toby's happiness, watching as he linked arms at shoulder height with the twins on either side, in a complex pattern of three steps forward, now three back, several cross steps, wide kicks, then begin again. Each sequence grew more complicated, and the little men drove the pace without mercy. I watched Ariante as she looked around the campfire, her eyes moving from one familiar face to the next. I could sense that she felt apart, cut off from her usual delight in the music and the feeling of being in the place she belonged. As she stared into the dark beyond the campfire, I knew what she was wondering. Is the decomp out there? I was wondering the same thing. Soon, I would have to tell Ariante that there was more than one and that they were here for her. Patting the cushion next to me, I invited Ariante to sit. As if on hue, Bacanyi took his place on the opposite side, his legs folded comfortably tailor fashion. The music wailed on, muting our words. Bacanyi and I have spoken, I said to Ariante. His instructions from Lord Vrenick's men were to deliver the invitation into your hands, nothing more. We must consider the situation carefully, Bacanyi said tracing the trinity mark on his palm with the stem of his pipe. This is most unusual. I have a passing acquaintance with Lord Rennick from our time at the Scola, until my life took a different turn. Bacanyi was still as stone, holding my gaze in a silent reprimand. He turned away, giving his attention to his pipe, tapping it on a convenient rock, asking as he emptied the bowl. Did the Master of Rebels at Renholm mention this? Bacanyi paused for a moment. This special performance? No, I replied. Our agreement was for public entertainment during the seven-day festival of Lofen, the goddess of mercy and forbidden marriages. 
My head began to ache in rhythm with Largo's drumming. There's nothing more to be done tonight, I said, and tomorrow we have preparations to make before we leave for River's End. Looking up, I saw that the stars were veiled by clouds. I hope the weather and that damned wheel will hold until we arrive, I said. I cannot speak for the wheel or the weather, but I will help you on the journey to River's End and beyond until Vrenholm, the Kanye said. His words sounded like a pledge, a fealty I didn't deserve. Then I realized that his words were not for me. They were for Ariante. I could sense the way her heart leapt, a spark flying upward in the night sky. At last, I thought, something is going according to plan. Ariante Grace On the second day of our journey to River's End, we met a merchant caravan carrying luxury goods, bolts of watered silk and scarlet, aquamarine and saffron, barrels of roasted coffee beans, shiny in their hues of golden brown to licorice black. A heady mix of spices, pungent turmeric root, curry, cumin, and others I did not recognize. While Soba inspected the spices, Lotus and Luna charmed the silk merchant into selling them several broken bolts for far less than what they were worth. Eliphas, who could smell a coffee bean from a league away, bought three large burlap sacks of dark roasted beans, ignoring Soba's disapproving glare. I ran my fingers over the book covers as they circled on ingenious rotating shelves. I heard Eliphas strike up a conversation with the caravan wagon master, asking if he had seen a good smithy nearby. Craning my neck around the corner of the wagon with all the books, I saw the Kanye approach Eliphas. After the wagon master returned to his duties, they spoke quietly, but with an intensity that allowed me to overhear them. Donus is a roundabout way to get to Vrenholm, the Kanye said. Why did the man always sound angry? It's true, Eliphas said, but the wagon master assures me that the smithy there is very skilled at mending wheels, such as ours. Interesting, the Kanye said, staring at the Japanese beetle that landed on his forearm. A smith who repairs hybrid tech is at risk for a visit from the scalded Dane. Let us hope that no visitors drop in before we have moved on, Eliphas said. It's also less likely that Sebastian will have drone trackers along the Denusian Valley. The Kanye shrugged, sounding indifferent. Why does that matter? Sooner or later, you must go to Vrenholm. Aye, Eliphas agreed, fiddling with the kerchief at his throat. I'd prefer later rather than sooner. Ha! The Kanye almost smiled. You mean to use the words of Lord Vrenik's sigil against him? Patting the Kanye on the shoulder, Eliphas said, You are as quick-minded as ever. We shall make haste, slowly. Their voices faded as they walked away, shoulder to shoulder. Before parting ways with the caravan, Soba made sure that we were well provisioned. We turned westward, following the serpentine Danus as it blazed its way through the lush river valley. My life slipped back into something like normal. Toby, who had made himself scarce during my recovery, sat next to me as we took turns driving the horses. One day, as he took the reins, Toby set a burlap-wrapped package on the wagon bench. I unwrapped the slim volume from its cocoon, releasing a faint coffee aroma. Toby, I signed, my hands trembling as they fluttered in the air. It's a book of the seven modes. I drank in the exquisite illuminated manuscript, ornamented with decorative borders and miniature illustrations. I hummed as my fingers touched each note of the scale. What a coincidence, I said. 
hugging the book to my chest. How's that? Toby sighed, shifting the reins to his other hand. It's nothing, I said, feeling self-conscious. It's... It's just that Bikanyi asked me about my last lesson with Eliphas before I sang for the dead man. Eliphas was talking about the seven modes. That's all. I gave Toby a one-armed bear hug, squeezing hard. You are the best brother ever, I said. Stop, stop, he signed, laughing. You're hurting me. I am not, oaf. I am demonstrating my profound appreciation. He pushed back a lock of dark hair with one hand, fingers on the other dancing. Remind me not to make you appreciate me. It hurts. This is a gift beyond imagining, I said. It must have cost you dear. If signing could sound smug, Toby's did. Lucky for you that the lad minding the book wagon was boastful and fond of wagering. Oh, Toby, you didn't. Indeed, I did. He bet me that I couldn't hit a target from 50 feet three times in a row. I choked back a laugh, sounding like a strangled chicken. That's practically stealing, Toby. You could make that throw blindfolded. Toby didn't look the least bit ashamed. He was rude and stupid. A stiff wind off the river made me shiver. Besides, Toby swallowed, his Adam's apple looking large for his slender neck. I wanted to give you something. His fingers barely moved. A visible whisper. Uh, you know, to make up for what happened. I forced myself to look up from the book, which I had been greedily leafing through. With each touch, the plain chant sang itself inside my head. By the great God's braid, Toby, what are you talking about? I asked. I wasn't there when you needed me. His signing was harsh and choppy, angry. My expression must have shown how dumbfounded I was, for he continued. I wasn't there when the decomp came for you. I wasn't there to keep you from feeding the ground with your blood. And then I nearly killed you with the knife throw I meant for him. For Bakanyi. I wasn't there for you, but he was. Slowly, on a count of three, and exhaled in the same manner. Then, as if preparing to sing, I paused and looked at Toby until I had his full attention. From the day Eliphas rescued us, we have been brother and sister, and that is what we will always be. It doesn't matter that we do not share blood and bone. Toby's fingers began to speak, but I took his hand and held it palm to palm with my own. Nothing can ever change the bond between us. You did not fail me on that day, or any other. I felt the water weight of a tear as it slipped from my eye, but I didn't brush it away. After a space of time, Toby nodded his head imperceptibly and reached up to touch my damp cheek. After that, we rode in companionable silence as I hugged the Book of Chance to my chest. Xanderin Bikanyi. The early spring weather was uncommonly clear and mild as we journeyed through the Denusian River Valley. We traveled on the remains of a stone-built road following the meandering river path. It was planting season for the early potatoes and hardy greens, but the Denusians were a merry-minded people, and they set aside their tasks in the sundown hour for the diversion the players offered. Broad of cheek and stout in body, the people of this lush valley smiled often, unlike their thin-lipped brethren to the north. We had packed up last night after our final performance at the tumble-down holding of Rufus Morphin. 
The surrounding villages sprung up like mushrooms around what must have once been a magnificent estate. Now adept at striking the set, I enjoyed the stowing of backdrops, props, and such. The stage of joined oaken planks folded to fit in a narrow slot that ran the length of the wagon. I particularly admired the clever roll of painted scenes that changed when raised and lowered by a pulley system. The ladies' players had everything they needed and a particular place for each of those things. It appealed to me. On this day, Ariante was studying the book that Toby had gifted her. Her brow was furrowed in concentration. It reminded me of the single-minded attention that Meister Micah brought to his studies. Her legs dangled out the back of the wagon, barefoot and carefree, as if the summons to Lord Vrenick's court had never happened. Eliphas had said that he thought some of the plain chants and songs in the book were written by someone called Jascan de Pre. Apparently he was a composer from a period on Old Earth that celebrated the rebirth of learning from an even more ancient age. To hear Eliphas tell it, the man was among the first to introduce a melody that he would then imitate as it traveled from voice to voice, often disguising it by strict forms that I didn't comprehend. A mathematician, musician, and magician, that's what Eliphas called him. The girl was a magician, if ever there was one. Her singing wasn't loud, but her voice enveloped me. It hummed in my bones and awakened memories I thought long dead and buried deep. I shook my head, disgusted with my thoughts, just as Xanthes tossed his head, ears pricking up. I was riding the rear guard and turned to squint into the lowering sun as it cast shadows on the rocky outcrops sprinkled across the Denusian floodplain. I saw a cloud of dust and it was coming our way. Not a storm, riders, a lot of them, given the size of the cloud. Xanthes and I galloped up the line, warning the others. Elithus directed the six wagons to head for a low rise of hills with scattered boulders and scree, the only remains of a once-was mountain. I knew that Elithus had adapted the wagons to accommodate tech enhancements, but I was surprised when he shouted orders to activate the suspenders. This was ancient tech, a mostly forgotten method of generating discrete gravity fields independent of mass. If I recalled my science lessons correctly, it was an anti-gravity mass suspension system. Suspenders. Freed from the burden of pulling the wagons, the horses flew forward as a cloud of dust came closer. I could hear the pounding of hooves now. How many do you think? Elifus asked, dropping back to ride with me. At least twenty. I said, maybe 30, even 40, I added, as we picked our way through the boulders to the place where the wagons rested. Demos and Toby were getting the last two wagons into position, completing the semicircle formation. Soba, Lotus, Luna, and the girl had already freed the draft horses from their rig, leading them up to a grassy plateau where white clover flowered and yellow crocus were poking their heads above the ground. Two by two, the brothers were carrying sawhorses up the hill to form a makeshift corral. I could make out individual riders among the dust cloud. Too many, I thought, as I helped position barrels, a plank table, and trunks to form a defensive outer barrier. Elifus handed me a spyglass saying, I don't see a sigil, but they are wearing battle gear. As I peered through the lens, he added, I don't think they are open to parley. I handed the spyglass back to Eliphas. You're right about that last part. 
I said. Mere moments later, Soba, who had the far-seeing eyes of a grasslander, said, They're scabs. People so vile they were cast out by their own kin, she said. They raid and rape and kill for reasons known only to them. The Artosi hate the scavs more than most, she said, spitting after speaking their name. They defile our sacred places, squatting in the cliff cave homes of our distant ancestors. We drove them out of the limestone cliffs and canyons formed long ago by the mighty Niami River. Still, small groups of them return, driven by bloodlust or a death wish, or for reasons only known to the Great Weaver. Taking up a spyglass that hung from her waist, Soba quickly scanned the line. It is curious that they have ridden so far from their territory near the edge of the Nephthian Desert. I have never seen scavs wearing battle gear, she said, giving Eliphas a sideways glance. There's a story here, I thought. When Eliphas remained silent, I asked, who would hire sword sellers to attack a troop of traveling entertainers? Eliphas waved away my question. No time for that now. Rin, you will lead the close combat with Lotus, Luna, Demos, and three of the brothers. Hold your attack until you see me raise a red banner, he said, pointing at the center wagon. The years fell away from Eliphas, his eyes bright and his movements quick. He actually winked at me saying, I have a little surprise for you. Toby, Eliphas shouted as he ran toward the wagons, help me get Dante, Damo, and Largo into position. My combatants clustered around me. Lotus and Luna, leading their sorrel mares, wore metal-studded leather greaves on their forearms, ornately pleated riding skirts, and long-sleeved tunics. Strings of rawhide bound their sleeves to keep their sword arms free. They each carried a naginata, a long pole with a handguard just above a deadly spear on the other end. Demos led his mount, a dark bay warhorse, almost as big as Xanthes. His stallion was quiet, even though Demos held a polearm with flames blazing from either end. A former boxer, ground wrestler, and blacksmith, Demos certainly had the strength to wield a battle axe, but the weapon secured behind his saddle was immense. The wooden handle looked to be five feet long, and the wicked crescent blade was nigh onto a foot between the upper and lower curves. Did you get that off a giant? I asked, pointing at the enormous weapon. Demos reared back his head and roared with laughter. It was a fair trade, he said. The giant offered his daughter in marriage. I bargained for the battle axe instead. Perhaps I traded one weapon for another. Even laughing, Demos was a fearsome sight. He had painted one half of his face blue, the other black, making his full lips look red and menacing in contrast. I had seen strange things in my time, but I stood like a gaping fool at Tutti, Presto, and Nuto seated on a wiry silver Turkoman, known for their fleetness of foot and endurance. Two Artosi baskets rested across the horse's withers, filled with their weapons of choice, juggling balls, wooden pins, and crystal spheres. Our attackers were closing fast, hooves thunderous as they rode in the extended straight line preferred by nomadic people. What is Eliphas thinking, I wondered, by all the gods that ever were? Does he expect that we can entertain our enemies to death by juggling for them? None of these people were mine to command, so I swallowed my outrage and checked the ear socks that Xanthes wore, as did the other horses. Then I touched the curved earpiece that snugged inside each of my ears. It was discomforting, but not painful. Soba had insisted that we wear them without explaining why. She's a lot like Eliphas in that regard, I thought. I spoke quietly to Xanthes. He tossed his head and pranced, trying to rid himself of the ear socks. Patience, Xanthes, I said. The fight will begin soon. I did not expect a good outcome, but I focused on the most important thing. Protect the girl, I said through gritted teeth, with no clear idea why I thought it was so important.
In spite of the ear inserts, I felt my bones buzz with a frequency I couldn't hear. Looking back at the wagons, I saw that Dante, Diamo, and Largo each manned a res frec, a resonance frequency disruptor, as Elifa sang into a makeshift audio horn. By the great goddess Ifri, I swore, how did he come by such an instrument of war? The initial sound waves targeted the center of our attacker's line. Grown men toppled from their saddles, writhing on the ground as blood poured from their ears. Others were carried away as their mounts reared and ran in all directions, colliding with other riders to increase the mayhem. Their line was broken into small pockets of riders and the few who staggered to their feet. I looked toward Elyphus and the red banner was raised, fluttering in a shadow time breeze. As we rode out to meet them, my eyes found Ariante between Toby and Soba. She was seated on a wheeled contraption, pedaling as if her life depended on it. Damnation, I said, grinding my teeth. What on earth is a life as... Before I could finish, we rode forth in a loose wedge formation, fanning out to dispatch the remaining riders. I was used to blocking out the noise of battle. It enhanced the scope of my awareness, as if I stood within a circle and innately knew what was going on within and around it. Pretty words for a man who was slicing heads off necks, blood burbling up like fountains. A few of the heads hung by a bit of tissue, swinging as their mounts ran on, eyes wide with terror. On this occasion, there was no sound to block out. It was a silent choreography of death. I blocked a strike to my head with the flat of my sword, forcing the rider's blade around and down, followed by a flat cut to slice his belly open, organs spilling out like awful. I turned Xanthes to see how the others were faring. Lotus and Luna rode with fierce abandon their lips moving in the ululation that the high maidens of the dance made in battle. They swept their naginata in wide, circling arcs to clear the space around them, before stunning or unseating riders with strikes to the side of the head, the neck, and the body. In movements quick and deft, they raised the opposite hand to flip the naginata, now riding with the spear pointed at the unfortunate man, who would soon be stuck as if he were a wild boar. Demos of the blue-black face twirled his fiery polearm with all the drama of his stage act. He looked as I imagined Svarad would, an ancient god of fire who loved a good argument and is mostly remembered because he liked to swear. He swept through our enemies, igniting them before he cleaved them in half with his axe. I couldn't hear the screams. Somehow that made it worse, for the cruel rictus of death was visible everywhere. I had been mistaken. Never underestimate the deadliness of distraction. Presto, seated in the middle, was standing, juggling wooden pins. I rubbed away the blood from a small cut on my forehead to assure myself that what I saw was true. The peak of his throw was high, rotating end over end, as if to touch the deepening purple-blue of the sky. He made the last throw extra high as he handed the other two off to Muto seated behind him. Catching the last toss, Presto threw the wooden pin at a rider's head, unseating him from his mount. Then Muto juggled the two pins in his possession, received a third and a fourth from Presto as he bludgeoned a slack jaw scab with successive throws to the chest and head. Tutti guided their Turkoman, circling their marks or shifting direction without unseating his brothers. Lotus and Luna then swept in like the Furies of old and stabbed the Fallen until they too joined the dead. I parried some half-hearted sword cuts and thrusts. It was clear that the few who remained were the less skilled fighters. Uncertain if they could hear me, I called for them to drop their arms and live. Apparently, there was someone or something they feared more than death, for the last dozen or so charged practically riding into our weapons. That's how I missed the rider with the spear. When I saw him, he was almost within range of the encampment. 
Xanthes, I cried, as his muscles bunched and released to drive us closer. I leaned in, willing us to go faster. Shaking free from my stirrups, I prepared to leap onto the rider. His arm was back, the release angle destined to bury its point in the heart of a lifus. Requiesco. The sound of the word reverberated, penetrating the air with an ear-filling thunder that rumbled toward me from all directions. Xanthes tossed his head and fought the reins for a moment. Requiesco. The sound was irresistible, as inevitable as intoxication is to a man who loves his drink. I recalled the word from the merciless Latin drills of my scola instructors. Its verb form in calm meant to rest, to pause, or to do nothing, and that's exactly what our enemy rider was doing. He and his mount both stood quiet. The spear had fallen from his hand, and he had the expression of a man who was having a delightful dream. It was Ariante. Her voice was powerful, encompassing, and irresistible. What would it have been like if Xanthes and I had not worn these earpieces, I thought. Ariante and I stared across the distance, our eyes locked on one another. For that brief moment, I was beyond questions or worldly care. Her brow furrowed as she grappled with the mystery of what had occurred. Then. She smiled at me, and I, like a slack-jawed village idiot, smiled back. I really hope that you enjoyed this episode. If you did, I have a small ask. To make it easy for you or your friends to follow the show, just use this link. It goes like this. Follow the podcast.com backslash history singer. That's it. Easy. Also, if you'd like to leave a rating and review to help others discover the show, I have an easy link for that, too. Simply go to lovethepodcast.com backslash history singer. You know, I thought I made this podcast for me because I felt compelled to tell this story. Now, I realize I really made it for you.